So um, I'd like to thank Annabelle and also Trump for having me today. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to discuss uh, with you and share some of the studies with made with my research lab. Um, I hope, of course, they will have some meaning for you and uh, help to have some, some possible discussion, if, if you want. Um, in fact, uh, as Annabelle mentioned, my um, research labs are uh, in inter-university uh, labs since they involve uh, both people from uh, the University of Burbino and the University of Bologna. Uh, due also to the fact that uh, currently I have research and didactic duties in both universities, so um, they usually involve um, both uh, these two, these two uh, universities. Um, Okay, and these in particular are the colleagues I have, that I have to mention before starting, uh, since they are those who are uh, specifically involved in the research topics I will talk about today. Um, then, of course, there are um, more students and other colleagues that participate to the different research activities, but for sure, these are the guys I have to mention and thank uh, for, the, for their work. Um, um, Okay, so I think we can start after, after this. Um, as you probably know better than me, uh, today uh, vehicles are equipped with many sensing uh, capabilities. So they are uh, basically able to generate data. And usually these data are sensed for purposes uh, mainly uh, related to the monitoring of the car itself uh, and uh, providing, for instance, information to the users of drivers such as uh, the temperature and so on, okay? But um, what uh, big data throws us uh, is that it is the aggregation of this data that can give uh, knowledge which cannot be obtained by the single data provided just by one uh, car. So uh, the aggregation of data allows for novel uh, smart services. And now, um, I don't want to, to, to spend much time on the type of possible services because I imagine that many of you uh, are more experts than me on the possible services since you probably work on this every day. But just to give some quick samples um, of what I had in mind about services, of course, if we talk about safety, uh, we do have possible uh, crash alert, uh, intersection safety, uh, something like combat wrong way driving, uh, uh, road weather, conditional earth, and so on. If we think of uh, info, uh, info and optimization, uh, we can think of traffic analysis that will may drive you to have some route optimization. Uh, and also maintenance of the car, which is also something related to safety, but uh, it doesn't matter at the moment. Um, and also uh, services related to <coughs> infotainment and uh, point point of interest uh, uh, and, and things like that. Then, of course, there are also other transportation, uh, other services that are related to transportation in general, uh, probably not that much um, linked to what I will go, I'm, I'm going to say, but for sure correlated to this, for instance, uh, the possibility to implement some data mules. Uh, so the, this means that uh, um, talking about the, the possibility that a car travels during a path and maybe uh, keep the data in areas which the, where there, are, there is no uh, internet connectivity available and then transport this data physically to places where you have an internet connection, then you can send the, the data to the destination. Uh, and yeah, we, we call this a data mule, as probably some of you know, uh, and the idea is that we can realize and implement some trusted data mules. Uh, and in general, also the sensing as a service where there are uh, sensors that send some data and through the vehicle, this data can reach some location. Uh, as I said, this is not related to that much to the picture I, I just gave you, but they are strongly related because there are problems related to authorization, security, and transportation in general. So uh, we have these smart services that we want to, to build. And in order to do that, uh, the goals that we have is to offer 
the possibility of sharing this data, aggregate this data, as I mentioned before, and also possibly trading the data. And this is one of the aspects I will uh, uh, point out later because it's a very, very important. Uh, so now uh, in, in the general picture we, we, we have. And the features to do this uh, are related to the possibility to controlling the assets to this data, to verify the data and to verify also the authenticity of the data and, and also immutability. The technologies to do this are related to <clears throat> what are called the distributed ledgers, if you want blockchains technologies, the possibility of using distributed storage, uh, smart contracts and authorization. So these are uh, mainly the ingredients that can be used in order to create novel smart services for uh, intelligent transportation systems in general. So what's the idea? <clears throat> As I said, the idea is that we have uh, uh, vehicles and send some, some data, okay? And uh, by the aggregation of this data, we can create uh, switch from the use of personal data, simple data that are created for the vehicle, for the user of uh, the user of the vehicle, to something that is more data storage and uh, something that is, can be aggregated. Um, that, that's the main idea. And of course, how can we deal with uh, all this data? How can we handle this data? The first option, which is uh, the usual one that is employed currently uh, in many situations is related to uh, the use of a central server. Okay, so the first option we have if, is that we use a central server and every time uh, a vehicle sends uh, and produces some data, basically this data uh, is transmitted somehow to the central server. Of course, this is something that works. It is used every day. Uh, so you can send the, your data to the manufacturer of the car, to the, your service provider, uh, to your uh, email provider and things like that. So your social network prefers of social networks and things like that. Uh, the main problem related to this <clears throat> is that basically you, users lose the sovereignty of their, their data. So they basically lose the data. They send the data to, to someone else, a data controller that gains the data uh, usually, it can have some profit from, from, from this data and possibly it can also alter the data. Uh, it doesn't happen uh, uh, usually, but it might, it might be. Uh, and then every time if the user uh, wants the, uh, his own data back, it must rely on the controller. So you lose the data. And that's one of the main problems related to, to this architectural um, solution, which is the common one at the moment. <clears throat> so what are the, the possible uh, alternatives to, to, to this? The other option, the second option I mentioned, which is of the opposite uh, of this solution is to uh, keep the data locally. So here in the car, uh, and distribute this data upon request. Uh, so every car here maintains its own data and when it is needed, they can send the data somewhere else. Of course, this is not a practical solution uh, because yes, the, you maintain your own data, but the, the, the vehicle, the car need to be always reachable. And also you must imagine that the car has enough uh, storage, computation and communication capabilities in order to perform computation and the transmission and so on. So this is another option, but it's not viable at all, <clears throat> of course. Um, the third option, which is, um, was actually very, very uh, considered uh, in the last couple of years, I have to say, is to use uh, instead uh, um, a ledger Okay, so a, a, a solution, which is a decentralized solution that uh, it is a, a, a distributed ledger, that, such as a blockchain, for instance, when you can put the data that you sensed. Okay, so before continuing with this, uh, 
since I don't know uh, any one of you, unfortunately, uh, and uh, I cannot give for, uh, for, for granted that you perfectly are aware of what a, a ledger is, just let me spend one minute, not, not more, on what uh, a ledger is in general. So a distributed ledger, that which is commonly referred as a blockchain, is basically a data structure that where data are, are, are stored. So you can imagine that these blocks are uh, a, a set of, of data, okay, uh, uh, some data, okay, a bunch of data, and these blocks are linked in some, some sense, creating a chain of blocks, a blockchain. Okay, and the idea is that in order to produce this blockchain, uh, imagine that you have this block here and then you want to generate another block containing novel data. What you do usually is that you take the, the first block, the last block you generated, you uh, process this block by uh, giving it an input to a hash function or something that produces a digest, which is basically a sort of fingerprint for your block. So on information that is strongly related to this one. And then what you do in the novel block that you're generating is that you insert this digest into the novel block and so on. When another block is generated, you create through this hash function another digest <coughs> for that block. And then you insert this digest into the novel, the novel block. What is the, the meaning? and why it is, this, it is important and, and effective. Because imagine that you want to change and alter this data here, okay? If you alter this data in this block, then you uh, lose the sort of mapping that you have between this data and the digest you generated. So in order to, when you change this information here, in order to make it consistent with uh, the, its own digest, you need to change also this digest. But this means that you have to change also the information which is contained in this block and so on. Since you change this block without, you have to change the digest that is, that is inserted here. And so you have to change also this block and so on. And this is something which is very costly and actually quite complicated to do because usually this data structure is replicated in different nodes in the, you know, on the internet, on the blockchain system. So when you have a lot of participants doing this becomes very, very difficult to, to do. And this is very important because it provides a, a lot of um, um, characteristics of the blockchain of the distributed ledger related to the immutability of information and the possibility to make some traceability. Okay, or now uh, in this slides, for the sake of brevity, I just mentioned a very quick overview of a blockchain, but uh, this can be generalized to different uh, distributed ledgers uh, that are organized information in a different way. But basically the, the, the philosophy behind um, all of this is the same. In this case, uh, the picture depicts uh, a snapshot of another data structure, which is IOTA, which is uh, the, the tangle, which is uh, the data structure employed by IOTA, uh, where data are organized in a different way, if you want, but the philosophy is, is the same. So uh, if you keep in mind that the, the peculiarities of the blockchain, it is more or less the same also for other distributed ledgers. Okay, so going back to, <coughs> to our solution, the option three we have, um, in order to use a ledger um, to register the data. So this is a solution that can, can be realized. The, the advantages of uh, employing such a solution uh, is that it's rather simple to implement. <clears throat> uh, basically, if you have a blockchain or a distributed ledger, you can use some API in order to send some data from one node to, to the ledger. So uh, inserting this data here is something that requires a user of an API. So you can implement this very, very quickly. Um, and also the other advantages is that, uh, is that as I mentioned, uh, it provides data integrity because once you insert uh, a data here, it becomes very difficult to alter the data and also to allow to, to perform some traceability because if you tra insert the data into the blockchain, you can trace the activities 
of all the nodes through uh, the, the, this um, process of uh, putting data into the ledger. <clears throat> However, uh, this approach has some, 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 some problems, some issues, because first of all, it is a good solution only if you have small size data. So because of how the, the data structure is created, you can insert here just some small information. You cannot, for instance, put some images or videos inside this data structure, okay? So it is very confined and constrained to, to this kind of data, small size data. Another big issue, which is related, um, which is quite quite important now uh, uh, in Europe, but I know that I know that also in California you have novel regulation that goes into the same direction. Uh, now in uh, in Europe we have this novel uh, regulation which is called GDPR. Uh, that's basically is uh, a European regulation related to the use of data. How uh, services must handle the data uh, and especially sensitive data. And uh, among this uh, several regulations, there are some, some specific uh, items related to the right to be forgotten or rectified. That this means that every belongs to, to, to a user um, must provide some, some uh, assurances related to the fact that if a user decides to delete the data from the, from, from the database or the, the storage, uh, it, is, it must be possible to do it. And similarly, if the user um, input decides that it wants to change some data related to him, he must be able to do it. Uh, so this is called the right to be forgotten or rectified. In a solution such as this one, you cannot do this. Okay, there is no, no way to have a right to be forgotten or rectified because once you inserted the data into a block, it cannot be removed or altered. So this is a very uh, important issue um, that um, is related to, uh, for sure, for the European community at least, but I know also, as I said, in California, there are some regulations very similar. And the third uh, issue is related to the latencies. Uh, in, in, this, uh, in the last part of my talk, I will show you some uh, re experimental results, uh, as Annabel mentioned, uh, that are related to the use of a particular distributed ledger, which is IOTA. And uh, I will show you that the uh, measurement we obtained at, at, the, at the moment of the experimentation were not that good, depending on the application, of course but they were not that good. So this solution has some, some pros and some cons that need to be considered for sure. <clears throat> the fourth option that we have is the use of a decentralized file system. Um, what does it, does it mean? What, what do I mean with this? Uh, basically, um, it is something that reminds to a peer-to-peer -peer system meaning that you have some nodes the geographically uh, distributed over the, the, the internet, the world, that can take some data and store this data for you, okay? Uh, so you basically distribute and replicate the data uh, into a, a given peer-to-peer-like system. Um, this is a quite hold if you want, and uh, uh, from certain perspectives, um, to, to uh, solution, system solution. Uh, there are some, some, some things that need to be uh, guaranteed. First, you need to ensure that integrity. Uh, another, another aspect is related to the control who has access to the data. And then you also need to ensure data persistence. How can we deal with this? As related to data integrity, one thing is to use a, as an approach similar to what we did before, meaning that uh, given a data, some data, you can associate with this data its own digest. So basically, when you have a data and you create a digest, you obtain something that uh, is specifically related to this. And so if you have a, a data which is in another node that has the same digest of the original data, you can be sure that the two 
copies of this data are equal. Okay, <coughs> so we um, switch from a classic location-based addressing of the data to a more content-based addressing, okay, where the hashes of the digests of the data um, somehow provide some uh, integrity insurance uh, to, to the quality of and the, uh, the integrity of the data itself. And one thing we can do in order to trace this is to put into a distributed ledger the hashes of the data. So basically, when you create a data, wh what you can do is to uh, upload not the data to the, to the uh, distributed ledger, but the hash of the data. You can upload this information in, into the ledger. And this provides you some integrity uh, guarantees because uh, once the hash is uh, uploaded here, then every time you want to check the validity of, of uh, the, the copy of the data that you find somewhere else into the, the, the decentralized file storage, you can always compare this hash with the hash that is stored here. And if they are the same, you are sure that this is the original data, okay? Uh, so using this, this approach is still possible to remove or modify the data. So we are able to guarantee the right to be forgotten and the right to be rectified. I mentioned before uh, due to the regula novel regulations, uh, because of course here you have the hash that cannot be deleted or rectified, but you can remove the data from the system if, the system, if there is a way to do it in the decentralized system, of course, but you can remove the data. Uh, it just remains uh, a log uh, of the fact that once the data existed <laughs> in the system, and this is traced into the, the distributed ledger, but the data is no longer uh, available. Uh, as well as if you decide to rectify a data, meaning that I want to alter the data, what you can do is that you can insert a novel version of the digest into the, the ledger. And basically you are logging the fact that you altered the data. So basically this distributed ledger becomes a sort of uh, uh, um, log, trusted log that cannot be tampered, uh, that ensure uh, the traceability of uh, the evolution of the data that you are uh, handling. What about access control? Of course, in this kind of uh, approach, uh, each node here and those that have access to this database can uh, read the data. So and if you use this very simple uh, approach when data is, uh, is not encrypted, so it's an open and a plain text data, you, everyone can read the data. If you want to add some access control, what you can do, of course, it to, is to encrypt this data. And so you maintain a, a, an encrypted version of the data, which is the distributed. And then you need to provide uh, users with um, a way to decrypt the data, of course. And here we have another problem. How can we perform some kind of authorization to decrypt the data? <laughs> well, also in this case, <laughs> We have um, several um, solutions, possible solutions. The simplest one is to employ a central authorization server, which is basically um, a server that maintains uh, just authorizations, um, meaning that they have the keys to decrypt the data. So every time in this, with this solution, every time a user uh, gains the data, which is encrypted and wants to decrypt the data, he can ask the authorization server that can check if that particular user is authorized to decrypt the data. And if it is, um, he provides the key to decrypt the data. This is a, 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 another solution. Uh, it is viable. Uh, of course, uh, it has some drawbacks if you want, because this uh, authorization server uh, becomes a central point, a central component of the system. It is a possible single point of failure. 
it is is uh, is it it is susceptible to security uh, uh, leakages. So if one is able to enter this database, it can uh, basically decrypt all the data that are stored here in this uh, decentralized storage. Um, and it can be also a malicious node, if you want, or be managed by a malicious user. And so we, we can have some problems with this. Uh, so another option, if you want, uh, can be using a, a more, if you want, sophisticated solution, where basically <laughs> you register into a, another ledger, in a ledger, um, an access control list. Here I have depicted uh, very in a very uh, schematic way a smart contract that runs on into into this uh, ledger, uh, which basically implements a, an access control list, meaning that here uh, the smart contract uh, records who has access to what. Um, and so here you it is specified, for instance, that Stefano uh, can decrypt the, the red data while, while Annabelle can decrypt the, the green one and so on. Um, and then uh, the authorization server, by looking at this smart contract, can provide the, uh, is able to, to understand and to verify if this specific user uh, is um, entitled to decrypt a given data. So if, if uh, uh, the authorization server must provide, uh, can, should provide the, the, the key to the crypt. Um, again, <clears throat> we might use another, uh, once again, a central server, but basically we have some of the problems I mentioned before. So I will not go into the details about this because it, it may be a little bit involved and uh, I do not have time to, to discuss this, but basically you can also employ some more uh, sophisticated security and solutions uh, where you have multiple authorization service that, service that based on what is written here into this smart contract can agree on the fact that they, need, they must send the decryption uh, key to that particular user. And in order to do this, there are several possible uh, security-based solutions such as uh, some secret sharing and other stuff. Uh, but basically the, the, the idea behind all of this is that uh, they can perform some kind of uh, agreement in order to understand if they must allow this user to decrypt the data, thanks to the information which is stored into this uh, smart contract. Um, so the benefit uh, of this solution is that uh, we have a decentralization of the keys custody. Uh, there is no more single point of failure and this mitigates somehow also privacy leakages. Uh, and also you have transparency because you have some kind of auditability of access permission to data due to the fact that servers must uh, interact with uh, a ledger and the smart contracts or every time they want to provide access to data to someone. Finally, data persistence. How can we ensure that is uh, persistent using uh, this kind of approaches? <laughs> um, because we, we would like to avoid this. This is uh, a popular chart that was published into this uh, paper uh, that showed the lifetime of uh, the torrents in the BitTorrent system. We, we probably know BitTorrent, which is popular peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing system. And what this uh, chart shows is that just few torrents lasted into the peer-to-peer -peer system for a lot of time, while the majority of uh, torrents uh, in the BitTorrent system usually stayed into the network for just some hours, basically. So uh, the idea is that after a while, every time you put uh, some, some data and some in, in, into a BitTorrent, uh, this torrent uh, lasted into the system for just hours. And we would like to be able to, to avoid this because we want to ensure if possible and whenever it is needed data persistence. So how can handle this? Because basically we are dealing with a peer-to-peer -peer system once again. <clears throat> and one solution to do this is just to create some mechanism which is uh, based on the use of uh, incentives to cooperate. So basically the idea is that if this node uh, and the other ones of course are the same, 
uh, maintain in, in their storage this data, they must be rewarded somehow. Um, and so they are incentivized to, 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 to offer the storage capability in order to keep it. And in order to do this in an uh, automatized way, what we can do is to employ some, again, some smart contract that provides tokens, if you want digital currencies, uh, to those based on their uh, cooperation, meaning that they maintain data for the others. So if you want that someone maintains your own data and persistent, you can basically pay with this virtual tokens, those nodes. This is a solution that is exploited by many, many decentralized storage systems, such as the one I mentioned here now. About this, some of this, uh, there, there have been some debate, uh, that some debate is going on uh, because of their uh, current implementations and uh, issues and things like that. So I will not go into that. But the, the general idea remains. You can offer incentives to cooperate uh, and maintain data into your storage for the others. So this is more or less the, the overall system. Um, <coughs> so the use of uh, the centralized file storage uh, in order to maintain your data. And then you can employ some distributed ledgers in order to offer some specific um, features and characteristics to, to your, your uh, uh, system. Here I de depicted two uh, uh, blockchains and two ledgers, different ledgers, uh, just to emphasize the different uh, characteristics that the, the, the ledger must have in order to ensure something. So for instance, in order to ensure that integrity, the ledger that we use should be uh, possibly free and fast, as fast as possible, because you have to upload information, uh, the hash of the information uh, from the, the, the distributed file storage to, to this ledger. While instead, uh, in order to have the authorization control, access control, and uh, data persistence of the incentives, you need to have a smart, smart contract enabled uh, ledger. I'm not saying that uh, this must be different uh, ledgers. Uh, I'm saying that um, in, in, in they need to have different characteristics. Uh, and in many cases, uh, in our implementation, for instance, uh, they are different ledgers. In, in fact, we in, in, our, in, the, in the implementation and the results I'm going to show you now, uh, this was uh, re, uh, implemented through over IOTA while this, uh, the ledger in order to realize the smart contract was uh, Ethereum. But if you find a, a, a blockchain or a ledger that offers all this, uh, all this characteristic, you, of course, you can employ just one. So uh, does it work? Uh, the answer is yes. We implemented uh, a system or the component of the system and we tested them and uh, we, um, verify the viability of this. Uh, I do not have a link to the GitHub uh, here, but if you um, go and look to the papers, I, I, I'm going to mention also in the last slide, you will find links to, to GitHub uh, where you have implementation of this. Um, <clears throat> the other question is, does it scale? <laughs> and as Annabelle mentioned, uh, Basically, my research is all about scalability. <laughs> uh, so it's something that <clears throat> I truly, truly uh, consider when I evaluate a system. Um, and in order to, to answer this question, which is, which is yes and no, the, the answer is, is basically yes and no, I will show you some tests on the, just on the data upload <clears throat> to the decentralized system we, we employ, because uh, of course, also the download aspects and the authorization and all the stuff uh, is um, important. And in fact, in the papers, I'm going to mention after uh, all of this is somehow tested uh, and verified. But uh, in this talk, I'd like to point out to the time required to upload the data because I think it's uh, the most tricky aspect in, in at the moment. So in order to do this, <coughs> we performed a, an evaluation 
which is partly simulated and partly a, a real test bed. Uh, in, in particular, um, we simulated uh, a set of uh, buses uh, that were traveling in Rio de Janeiro using a real mobility trace we found uh, on the web, which is available. So basically, yeah, as you can see here, you have this dots, uh, colored dots in the, in the map of Rio de Janeiro. This represents uh, the path of a different, uh, a portion of the path of different buses, just uh, a subset of the, of the buses we consider it. And every time you see a dot, this represents uh, the simulation of the fact that the bus were uh, sensing some data and were sens uh, sending this data to the decentralized system uh, I was mentioned. Um, so this, uh, the trace was real. Uh, the, the behavior of the, the buses was simulated in the sense that we have a simulation that um, generated the data, but then the distribution, the transmission of the data to the system was real. And uh, we tested two different uh, system configuration, uh, what I called before the option three, uh, meaning the use of uh, a distributed ledger as the data storage. Um, so basically, <clears throat> we employed IOTA. We selected IOTA because at the time it was the most promising solution uh, among the different blockchain. I mean, and blockchains, I mean, you cannot employ Ethereum to upload data every time it is generated uh, or, or other stuff. So IOTA was uh, the more mature between the uh, ledgers that are um, thought to, 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 to perform this job. So basically this option three was uploading data directly to IOTA. And then another option, the, the, the other test that we made was the option four, meaning that we um, uploaded the data to IPF to different decentralized file storage systems. And, uh, and then we performed also this, the stuff related to the put, putting the hash into uh, the, the IOTA, the DLT. And in this case, we employed two uh, famous uh, decentralized file storage system, IPFS and CF. So these are the results related to the option three. So the use of the ledger, distributed ledger only. Um, here we, you, you see different um, configurations. Uh, basically, I, I will not go into the detail because I'm running out of time. Uh, basically, if you want, you can just look at this, which is the best uh, heuristic in order to upload data. I mean, in this case, we basically made some kind of, uh, um, smarter uh, approach to upload the data with respect to the two other experiments in the sense that in this case we, we had different IOTA nodes and we selected dynamically which was the best one to upload uh, to use to upload the data. Uh, and as, as you can see um, in this uh, in this good solution we found out the time the average time more or less to upload uh, data was 20 seconds for each data, which was basically a very small sized uh, data. Imagine a, a sense data, so something like just few bytes that must be uploaded to, to IOTA. So for every, for every um, uh, data you upload, on average, it requires 20 seconds, which is not a negligible time, of course, uh, with a very low percentage error and a very low standard deviation, actually. If you do not use a good uh, heuristic, such as, for instance, you take one node, IOTA node, and you ask always to the same node, you have worse, um, def definitely worse results, as you can see. Uh, okay, and this is the cumulative of the same results. It's not important at the moment. Um, <clears throat> instead, these are the, resu the results of the what I call the option four, meaning that you send data to the decentralized file system. And we co uh, compared three different approach, approaches, the CS Skynet, uh, an IPFS um, traditional service, meaning that we asked to a, 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 an open and uh, well-known uh, IPFS uh, node to, uh, to insert the data. And then this, uh, the name is maybe a little bit unfortunate, but this IPF proprietary mean, is means that 
uh, we employed a dedicated node we installed um, with, with IPFS to, to upload the data. And as you can see <coughs> here, uh, this third um, option using a dedicated node uh, with IPFS running is the best solution. On average, uh, we, we, the, the, the times required to upload data uh, varies from zero to four seconds. Uh, here is the increasing number of uh, users. So if you want the buses, it should be buses, but it's the same. Um, so the, the, the times uh, are definitely lower than the option I mentioned before, with very few errors in this case. Uh, in the, others, in the other uh, uh, configuration, we have important uh, latencies as, as well and important errors as well. And in this case, I'm mentioning here, um, the kind of data that are, are uploaded are like this one. So small size J data, such as 100 bytes, something like this. We also made uh, some tests with some larger files, such as images, one megabyte images. And as you can see, we have similar results. The only, um, of course, the, the times uh, increase. Uh, the only aspect that is uh, worthy of um, mention is that after a while, the, the, so the best solution we found out here, after a while doesn't scale anymore. But this simply means that if you have a lot of users that sends a lot of important data, probably you need to employ not just one node uh, dedicated to, to the application, but you need to replicate more nodes. And so in this, uh, using this approach, uh, the, the, the solution will scale. But definitely from a, a scalability point of view, this um, option is better than the, the one I mentioned before. Not mentioning the fact that this allows you also to rectify data and delete data if you want from the system. So uh, that's it. Um, I'm in time, luckily enough. <laughs> so basically in this talk, I tried to uh, show you that you can build uh, reliable uh, services for smart transportation uh, that uh, provide some, some uh, uh, maintain some data sovereignty to the users. Um, and these are based on the use of distributed ledger technologies uh, combined with decentralized file storages and authorization schemes. And of course, also through the use of smart contracts, which are something which is usually provided into for, um, from many distributed ledger technologies. Uh, the, the solution we, we, we I talked about was basically a combination, as I said, so if you want this sort of layered architecture. And yeah, some concerns uh, still remain uh, and should you be paying attention to the level of scalability of responsiveness, I think, because uh, our, our, our um, results show that you need to increase the ability to handle charms and you need to be careful of how you set up your, your distributed system. And also, of course, uh, when we build this kind of system, you need to be careful while handling sensitive data. So you need to perform some authorization uh, and uh, proper management of sensitive data. Okay, so I think um, that's it. Um, if you have any question, I will be happy to try to answer. Thank you, Stefano. I do have one question. It's accompanied with an apology for being basic, but here goes. No, 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 please. <laughs> From Sanchit, why use blockchain in the scenario, for example, the Rio de Janeiro case you mentioned? Why not use the centralized storage or a non-blockchain technology? Uh, well, the, 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 the idea was uh, that I was mentioning uh, at the beginning. Um, um, let me go back. I mean, uh, the idea is that uh, depending on the application, of course, you have. If you lose, if you use a, sorry about that, <laughs> I'm going back. If you use such a kind of solution, you lose the sovereignty of the data. So 
uh, it depends truly on the application you want to, 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 to provide. Of course, if this data are just, I mean, if you think of something like, um, I agree that if you think of something like buses that send uh, uh, data to the municipality, then you can of course use this kind of solution because the, all the buses uh, generate data, which is for this, this kind of central service. And in this case, it's quite uh, common to, to have to have um, uh, a solution like this one. The problem is related to the fact that when you have some, some of your data and then you want to combine this with other data that comes from other users, but, but you do not want to, to, to give away your data to a central server, some, something like what you commonly use when you uh, share something on your social network or something or you provide uh, data to, uh, I don't know, Google or Apple or whatever <laughs> is the, the, the provider you use, um, then things become more, 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 more tricky. Um, and uh, in, you can imagine scenarios when, you have, of course, you have sensitive data, you have measurements, and but maybe you want to uh, also trade your data. I mean, I provide some data to you, but my data has some value. So when I share my data, I want, for instance, to gain something. And every time people want to use it, I want, I want to, to, to gain something, which is not money. Uh, I mean, it can be, but it, it might be also all the things, such as uh, uh, tokens that allows you to, to employ other data and things like that. So you can create a sort of uh, data ecosystem when I have some data that I might want to share, but I want to have some feedback from, from, from this sharing. In this, in this solution, in this case, then uh, an approach such as this one is not the, 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 the correct one because, as I said, you lose the data sovereignty. Uh, and uh, uh, the, I, I read this sentence uh, from one from the Dell technology, I think, uh, that says that data sovereignty is, will be the issue of the next decade. Uh, I, I have to agree with this. Um, of course, uh, going back to the experimentation, I agree that maybe the, considering the, the buses, uh, you might lose this aspect because you have the same kind of, uh, um, the same kind of uh, uh, vehicles that share some data, Samsung data. So in this case, it might be a little bit different, uh, but in this case, this scenario was just to test um, the scalability of a solution such as uh, that I mentioned before. Um, so in this sense, I think uh, th this test bed was uh, useful as enough to show some of the peculiar aspects of these de decentralized systems. I hope to, to have answered the question. I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Can you estimate if these results would improve with IOTA's chrysalis performance update in March? Are further tests planned? Yeah, uh, that's, that's, an, that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, I agree that we should probably uh, um, replicate the test now uh, when there will be some, some novel, because uh, they are, they are, they are uh, changing a lot of things. So I'm pretty interesting, interested in having some uh, novel measurement, and uh, yeah, it is my intention to uh, investigate on this by making some 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 research with some of my students on this. But I, at the moment, I don't have I do not have any answer. So I I, I hope that will be uh, there will be a significant improvement because I know that they are changing a lot of things. So yeah, but I do not have any 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 answer at the moment. No part two yet. Any other questions? Okay, I think we will close it out. Stefano, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Oh, I encourage you. the uh, more technical people in our audience to visit your GitHub. So I'll be sure to include that in my follow up. 
In two weeks, we will have a panel on Mobi standards for the deployment of vehicle identity on blockchain, and it will be moderated by our working group's lead, Rajat Raj Bandari. Stefano, I invite you to join us again um, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.